You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. So coming up in episode 77 of the GDPR Weekly Show, we have breaking news of a alleged data breach by the team supporting Sir Keir Starmer in his bid to become the next leader of the Labour Party in the UK. We look at a call from Infrastructure Minister Nicola Mellon to review the contract that the Department of Industry has with Just Park following the data breach at Just Park. We have news of a data breach which has exposed the details of some 17,000 yachting industry professionals from over 50 countries. The dating app Tinder finds itself subject to a GDPR investigation. We have news of a bit of a spat between the German ICO and the Irish DPC, with the German ICO accusing the Irish DPC of being under-resourced and dragging its heels into the large number of large corporate data breaches, including Google and Facebook, which the Irish ICO has been investigating now for quite some time. We then take a look at the enforcement landscape for GDPR as we move into 2020 and what you as organisations can expect from your various ICOs across your different countries in terms of enforcement and where they are choosing to concentrate their activity and so perhaps where you as organisations need to be concentrating minds. And then finally, in response to a request from several of our clients, a look at when medical research is regarded as a suitable legal basis for processing personal data under GDPR. So, as always, quite a mixed bag for you this week. I hope there's something there that will be of interest to you and that you find useful and informative. As always, if you have any suggestions for future episodes of the GDPR Weekly Show, we always welcome those. Please just drop us an email to podcast at insurity.co.uk. We do receive a large volume of emails from you every week and it's really great to have your feedback on the show. Unfortunately, it does mean that we don't have time to reply to them individually, but please be assured that every single email we receive and feedback to the show, we do read and we do take into mind when we're planning future episodes of the GDPR Weekly Show. Check us out on Facebook. We begin this week with news of a data breach being reported to the Information Commissioner's Office, to the ICO, by the Labour Party, and the breach alleges that members of Sir Keir Starmer's leadership campaign team have been hacking into the Labour Party's membership database. Now, for those of us in the UK, may probably well aware of the Labour leadership campaign which is underway at the moment, but for those perhaps listening from overseas who aren't, there are currently four contenders to take over the leadership of the Labour Party from Jeremy Corbyn, and they are Sir Keir Starmer, Lisa Nandy, Rebecca Long-Bailey, and Emily Thornbury. The allegations by the Labour Party are against two members of Sir Keir Starmer's team, one of them understood to be his compliance official. It is understood that the official complaint was made to the Information Commissioner's Office on Thursday, the 6th of February 2020. Satir and his team have said that the claims are utter nonsense. The allegations are serious and the confrontation has engulfed the campaign in bitter recrimination. The ICO, for its part, has confirmed that it's received a report of the membership database breach and has begun making inquiries. We understand that the team of Satir Starmer have been accused of data scraping seeking to obtain certain information from a wider set of data. Late last night, Satir wrote to the Labour Party flatly denying any wrongdoing by his team members. He insisted they were investigating a means of penetrating a database called Dialogue with no intention to use it. Supporters of Satir Starmer, who currently has the support of twice as many local Labour parties as any other candidate, have suggested they were now victims of a politically motivated effort to damage him and his campaign. Jenny Chapman, the former Labour MP who is chairing Satir's campaign, said no one in the team had the capacity to hack into any of the party's databases 
and even if they did have the capacity, they wouldn't do it anyway. It is a very serious accusation, and that is why I'm here to defend it, she told Radio 5's Pineas Politics. This isn't even a situation where you say some over-enthusiastic young volunteers may have done it. It simply didn't happen. Jenny Chapman went on to suggest that the allegations had only surfaced after a team had alerted Labour officials last week of what they believed was a potentially a very serious data protection breach by the rival campaign of Rebecca Long-Bailey. In most last week, the Rebecca Long-Bailey's campaign circulated links to volunteers capable of allowing them access to Labour Party phone banks. The campaign said it acted innocently, but Jenny Chapman said she believed something wrong had taken place. She went on to say, we wrote to the Labour Party, and we thought that was the end of it as far as we were concerned. And the next thing you know, a couple of people in our campaign get letters saying, actually, we think you've done something wrong. She added, Labour members simply want a fair contest. Whoever decided to send these threatening letters to people on the Starmer campaign and then leak it to the BBC are not really doing the Labour Party or their preferred candidate any favours. The Labour Party said in a statement that it had written to Sir Keir Starmer and his three leadership rivals to remind them of their obligations under data protection law and to seek reassurances that membership data will not be misused. The Labour Party takes its legal responsibilities for data protection and the security and integrity of its data and systems extremely seriously, the statement said. It most last week that the rival campaign of Rebecca Long-Bailey had circulated links to volunteers capable of allowing access to membership database. Her team say this was done innocently. Under the party's leadership rules, any candidate who makes it to the final stage of the contest later this month will be entitled to receive data, details of party membership and registered supporter lists containing names, telephone numbers and postal addresses. But the party's team to stress we're not at that point in their selection process yet. So Keir Starmer, Rebecca Long-Bailey and Lisa Nandy are already qualified after getting sufficient support from trade unions and other bodies affiliated to the party. Emily Thornbury has still yet to do so. It's understood that all the eligible candidates are being required to provide guarantees that the information will be stored securely and processed lawfully before access to the information is given to them. So we wait and see what happens with this. Um, if we get any update either from any of the four candidates or indeed from the Labour Party themselves or from the Information Commission's Office, the ICO, we will of course bring it to you in a future episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. The UK's Infrastructure Minister, Nisha Mallon, has asked for a review of the contract with JustPark after details of a data breach. The move comes after details of more than 4,500 people were published on the corporate section of the JustPark website. JustPark, which took over the running of the parking app last month, has since amended the glitch, but the Department for Infrastructure said that their minister, Nicola Mallon, was far from satisfied. A spokesperson said, while the department understands that the issue being reported was limited in its nature and has been told by Just Park that the information commissioner has been informed and does not require a formal report, it is far from satisfied. Its parking contractor, NSL, which holds the contract with Just Park, has also apologised to the department and indicated that it is very much aware of the seriousness of the situation as in, and has impressed upon Just Park the need for an urgent and appropriate response. The Department of Industry said while this was welcome, it noted that this was not the first time customers had experienced problems with the Just Park app. The Infrastructure Minister has demanded immediate action by both companies to ensure there is no further impact on customers and has asked for a review of the contract in place with Just Park to ensure that its terms and conditions are rigorously enforced, a spokesman for the Department said. As a result of the data breach, names, email addresses, mobile numbers, car mates and registration numbers from across the UK were all available. The amount businesses were paying and their parking history was also available to see. In a statement, Just Park's founder and chief executive, Anthony Estinazzi, admitted that there was an isolated incident which shouldn't have happened. He said that he unreservedly apologised for the incident but denied that there had ever been a major data breach. He added that Just Park had informed the Information Commissioner's Office of the breach but since only one of its clients had been able to access the information, it was unnecessary to file a formal report. Organisations are required to notify the Commissioner within 72 hours of becoming aware of a serious data breach, unless the breach does not pose a risk to people's rights and freedoms, in which case, of course, as you all know by now, if you're a regular listener to the GDPR Weekly Show, 
you need to record details of the breach in your data breach register. And we have to assume that JustPark have done that. JustPark has replaced previous operator Park Mobile for the contract, and last week the company said it had experienced some teething problems. Several users told BBC New Northern Ireland that they had received error messages, incorrect bills and penalty charge notices. We will be attempting this week to follow this up with Just Park and to get more information from them. And if we can do that, or if we hear any more from the ICO, we will of course bring it to you in next week's episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. The website Verdict had a exclusive this week when it revealed details of a data breach which had exposed the personal details of 17,000 industry professionals in the yachting industry. The data breach occurred at UK-based Crew and Concierge Limited, which is an international recruitment agency specialising in securing staff for ultra-high net worth clients' yachts operating right around the world. It is understood that the data breach exposed the personal data of 17,379 people of 50 different nationalities, but all of which were working in the yachting industry. The server, which was discovered during a verdict investigation, consisted of over 90,000 files, all of which appeared to relate to individuals on True and Concierge's books. It was left exposed on a misconfigured, unsecured Amazon Web Services S3 bucket and appears to have been online and available for anyone to access without a password since February 2019. Now, regular listeners will know this is far from the first example of an Amazon Web Services bucket being left unprotected. And perhaps that's a lesson to anyone using Amazon Web Services S3 buckets, just to make sure that you have got them uh, locked down and only those people who you think should have access to them do have access to them. Anyway, back to the story in hand. Crew and Concierge, which is registered as a data controller with the UK Information Commission Office, secured the bucket within hours of being notified of the data breach. Crew and Concierge said it had not seen any evidence that any of the files had been maliciously accessed. For all individuals, the data exposed included a CV or resume, and in most cases, this contained the information individual's full name, their phone number, email, nationality, what visas they held, their date of birth, their work history, and any professional qualifications. It is understood that there were 1,295 scanned copies of passports, around 1,000 of which are still in date, and at least 500 standard visas and over 1,000 seafarer medical certificates, known as ENG1 forms. In a statement to Verdict, Sarah Duncan, director of Crew and Concierge, said that the company had taken a number of steps to resolve the breach, including hiring a cybersecurity expert. One can't help feeling that was a little bit the case of shutting the door after the horse had bolted, but anyway. In their statement, Crew and Concierge said, From the moment we learnt of the breach, my team and I have worked tirelessly to identify the sources of disclosure, detect the areas of weakness, close the vulnerability, recover control of the data, identify precisely what data was compromised, and minimise the potential risk and harm to the affected individuals. We have been advised by the cybersecurity consultant that exploitation of S3 buckets is by no means a straightforward activity, and it appears likely that the individual or individuals responsible developed advanced tools designed specifically to identify AWS customers, and whether or not they have misconfigured incidents that may leave it open to a malicious attack. In our case, the confidence was placed in our team of developers that we had hired, trusting that they would do a competent job and implement appropriate and proportionate technical and organisational measures to ensure the protection of the large volumes of information, including personal and sensitive personal information relating to our registered crew. We have since established that the breached AWS S3 bucket that we outsourced contained personal data stolen by a malicious actor based on a misconfiguration by a third party and subsequently published into the public domain. This impacts crew and concierge and its valued clients and staff for which we take full responsibility as the data controller. In a very short period we have come to understand the true impact of a cyber attack and we have learnt many valuable but hard lessons. I would like to confirm that to date we have no confirmation from the journalist or the site that exposed our data that these files have been accessed. For the Information Commissioner's Office, a spokesperson said, Crew and Concierge Limited has reported an incident to us and we will assess the information provided. 
Now, while a large proportion of those affected were from the UK, South Africa and Australia, there were over 50 nationalities represented in the data breach. As the agency finds individuals for a wide range of different roles within the yachting industry, there are also a large range of supporting files, many of which contain personal data. For a significant minority of the individuals affected, there were over 10 different documents, including letters of reference from previous employers, as well as special qualifications and other supporting documents. One of the most serious examples was the presence of 1,419 medical certificates, which included details such as vision and hearing, health, alongside full name, date of birth, passport number, and a small number of drug test results. There were also thousands of professional certificates, including personal survival, first aid and fire prevention, as well as over 500 licences, which were a mixture of maritime and driver's licences. In a small number of cases, there were also military service records, with eight different navies represented. As crew and the edge also places chefs, there were at least 1,900 sample menus. So why might this be a problem? Well, because if the bucket has been accessed by cyber criminals, the data exposed put those affected at risk of a host of crimes. Cyber criminals can do a lot of damage with a large list of breached data, such as obviously, you know, pretending to be uh, identity theft, if you like, so stealing someone else's information, uh, stealing someone else's qualifications. You know, lots of things here that have real value on the black market, the dark web market. And so this could potentially be a very serious data breach, albeit that the number of records concerned is not particularly large. So we wait and see what happens in this case and what action the ICO will take. But it's likely that the ICO will look to impose a fine on crew and concierge for this data breach, given the nature of the data that has been breached. Um, so we wait to see what happens. And when we have any update, either from Crew and Concierge or from Verdict or from the Information Commissioner's Office, we will, of course, bring that to you in a future episode of GDPR Weekly Show. And in the meantime, we'd like to congratulate Verdict for uncovering this data breach in a fine piece of journalism. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. Dating app Tinder is the latest uh, online service to find itself under formal investigation in Europe over how it handles user data and in particular how it's complying with GDPR. Ireland's Data Protection Commission, DPC, the equivalent of the UK ICO, the Information Commissioner's Office, announced on the 4th of February that it was launching a formal probe into how Tinder processes users' personal data, the transparency surrounding Tinder's ongoing processing of the data, and Tinder's compliance with obligations with regard to data subject access requests. Under GDPR, EU citizens have a number of rights, as you all will know by now, hopefully, as regular listeners to the GDPR Weekly Show, such as the right to request deletion or the right to obtain a copy of their data. While those entities processing people's personal data must also have a valid legal basis to do so, and of course data security is another key consideration which is important in ensuring compliance with GDPR. The DPC said that complaints about Tinder have been made from individuals in multiple EU countries, not just Ireland, but the Irish regulator was taking the lead under a GDPR mechanism which is set up to manage cross-border investigations where one particular ICO within Europe, normally where the company under investigation has its main office or where it's actually registered as its primary source for GDPR, then that regulator takes charge of the investigation. And for a good number of online services, that regulator is the Irish DPC. The DPC said the Tinder probe came about as a result of active monitoring of complaints received from individuals both in Ireland and across the EU in order to identify particular themes or possible systemic data protection issues. The inquiry of the DPC will set out to establish whether Tinder has a legal basis for the ongoing processing of its users' personal data and whether it meets its obligations as a data controller with regard to transparency and its compliance with data subject rights requests, the DPC said in a statement. It is not clear exactly which GDPR rights have been complained about by Tinder users at this stage, but some users are known to have accused the company of not providing a copy of all the data that it holds on them. 
Tinder's parent company, Match Group, have said in a statement, Transparency in protecting our users' personal data is of utmost importance to us. We are fully cooperating with the Irish Data Protection Commission and will continue to abide by GDPR and all other applicable laws. Doubtless this one will take some months to come to fruition, uh, but once we have any update on this, either from the DPC or from Tinder themselves, then we will of course bring it to you in the next available episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. In the previous article about Tinder a few moments ago, we mentioned about the fact that a complaint against a organisation or a service which is available across several EU countries tends to be investigated under an agreement whereby the investigation is carried out by the country where that organisation has registered for GDPR. However, because of the large number of international companies who've registered with the Irish Data Protection Commission as their ICO, there are concerns that Ireland's DPC, the Data Protection Commission, is overwhelmed with the sheer task of the number of companies they're having to regulate and it needs more resources and it should be prepared to accept outside help. And this has been brought to a head this week by Germany's Federal Data Commissioner. At a meeting of the European regulators last week, Ulrich Kalber likened Ireland's approach to regulating Facebook with the Joe Slow approach of Germany's automotive regulator on diesel emissions fraud. Mr Kalber's main complaint settles on the lack of rulings from Ireland's Data Protection Commissioner ever since the new data protection rules GDPR came into force on 25th of May 2018. GDPR gives Ireland's regulator frontline responsibility for overseeing Dublin-based tech companies, but what had been devised as a one-stop shop to simplify regulatory oversight had, Mr Cabber suggested, led instead to regulatory standstill. None of the cross-border cases under new data protection rules have been addressed, Mr Cabber told the Irish Times. This touches largely on cases where the headquarters of the company is in Ireland, but he made clear that that was not the only country which he had concerns with. The German regulator went on to insist that he was not having a personal attack on his Irish colleague Helen Dixon, but a criticism of the professional performance of a body insufficiently equipped for its task. And indeed, we know from other conversations that we've had that Helen Dixon, as the Irish uh, DPC, has previously expressed to the Irish government her concern that she doesn't have the resources that she needs to perform her task effectively. She was backed up in this by Mr Kelber, who said that, in his view, the DPC clearly needed better financing and more staff. Back in October last year, Helen Dixon said she was disappointed that her office employing 140 staff had received just an extra 1.6 million euros in the Irish budget, a third of the additional funding she'd sought, bringing its total funding allocation to 16.9 million euros. A DPC spokesman, however, dismissed Mr Cabber's criticism, saying, This singling out the Irish DPC is not new from the Federal Commissioner. We're just busy with getting on with the job of concluding our investigations. The German federal regulator has suggested a streamlined system allowing the transfer of cross-border cases to a European data protection agency if a three-quarters of the majority of the EU member states' regulators were in favour of such a transfer. The regulator in Hamburg, where Facebook has its German headquarters, has suggested imposing a time limit for national authorities to reach a finding or have the case revoked by European authorities. That a few national EU regulators were struggling with the main burden of data protection not only put citizens and their rights at a disadvantage, but it added to the profits of data collecting corporations, said Hamburg regulator Johann Kasper, but it was also creating a competitive disadvantage for European companies. Acceptance of GDPR will sink or swim based on the fairness of its implementation, said Johann Kasper, and he called for harmonised European investigation rules instead of the current patchwork of national procedures. And indeed, this is something which we've identified previously ourselves in previous episodes of the GDPR Weekly Show, is that although there are a common set of rules, you know, GDPR is the same right across Europe, and that was its 
found in mantra and we are strong supporters of that mantra where it has maybe stumbled a little is that the actual penalties imposed vary considerably from one european state to another and at the moment still including the uk in that although we've now obviously had the first stage of brexit but since we're still in the transition phase i'll keep us in that picture too so a we have the problem with penalties and b we do have this problem that certain investigators um, controllers such as the irish dpc simply have the lion's share of the companies to investigate and that's not any fault of theirs it's not even any fault of the companies actually it's due to different taxation regimes that have operated in the past across different european countries but nonetheless there's no end escaping the fact that it is causing a problem and so whilst i'm not sure i support the german regulators suggestion i do see some way in the idea of there being a time limit after which if a case hasn't been investigated it perhaps passes to another european regulator to investigate instead but the question then comes of course of who gains the financial sums from the penalties that are imposed and there would need to be some negotiation on that so we hope that this can be progressed as we go through 2020 and i'm sure it's a subject that we will return to in a future episode of the show you're listening to the gdpr weekly show with your host keith budden now that we're into 2020 it's clear that the various icos across europe are looking to move more to enforcement than possibly they have in the previous 18 months and so what particular trends can we pick up on well to date uh, the various icos data protection authorities have levied 190 fines and penalties under gdpr spain surprisingly has led the pack as Europe's most active regulator having made 43 enforcement decisions so far followed by Romania which has made 21 decisions and Germany who's made 18. The UK has imposed the highest total amount of fines totaling more than 315 million euros but that's assuming that British Airways and Marriott's fines are both upheld after their current appeals. Following in fines are France's Commission Nationale de l'Informatique et de Liberté, who imposed just over 51 million in fines, although it has to be said, of course, that the bulk of that was in one judgment against Google, and Germany's DPA, who imposed fines of nearly 25 million euros. So what's been triggering these fines and penalties? Well, it tends to be failures of data governance. DPAs have primarily acted against the infringement of Article 5, the principles of processing of personal data, and Article 6 of GDPR, the lawfulness of processing. These rules contain key data government principles, including data accuracy and quality, and fairness of processing, and also look at when firms collect and process data, that they're processing the minimum amount of data necessary for their task, and that they have a clearly defined purpose. The firm struggled greatly to meet requirements around consent and other available legal bases. It's worth pointing out that if you're unsure why you are holding data or whether you are likely to fall foul of Article 5 or Article 6 of GDPR, then we would be delighted to help you. So if you do feel that at any time, then please do get in touch with us at podcast.insurety.co.uk. That's E-N-S-U-R-E-T-Y.co.uk and one of our specialists will get back to you and uh, hopefully provide you with the help that you need. The other thing is to say is that perhaps it's a misconception to say that it's only data breaches that the various data protection authorities are looking at. That's certainly not true, although it is true, of course, that data breaches do tend to get the enforcement ball rolling, but they are just a starting point. It's worth noting that DPAs have undertaken some 50 actions for infringement of Article 32, which is security requirements under GDPR, and a few more related to failure to report breaches. These cases show that an actual security incident is just a starting point for determining fines. Investigations that followed some of the biggest breaches of the post-GDPR era 
focused not only on the specific conditions of the breach itself, but also highlighted poor security arrangements or the lack of adequate authentication procedures. And it's not necessarily only a data breach that affects thousands of individuals, which can be expensive. Uh, The fines and penalties that have been imposed have proven that compromised data from just a single customer can be expensive because DPAs evaluate the impact of the breach, not the volume. For example, Spain's data protection regulator fined two telephone operators, each of which had an issue with a single customer. One of the telcos had erroneously disclosed credentials of a third party to a customer, allowing the customer to gain access to sensitive third party data. This single event led to the provider being fined €60,000. The DPA fined another telco provider almost €40,000 for processing the data of a single customer without their consent. And elsewhere in Europe, in Germany, a hospital was fined €105,000 for GDPR violations associated with the misuse of data of a single patient. So it's not just the volume, it's what the data is and what the potential harm to the individual is that the DPA is taking into account when they're calculating what the final penalty should be. The next wave of final penalties are likely to come from failures to respect individuals' rights. Most current enforcement actions refer to data access requests and data deletion. For example, a German property company that, among other issues, archived customer data in a way that didn't allow for data deletion was fined €14.5 million. Euros. Enforcement to date has primarily come from customer requests, but enforcement actions from employee requests are definitely increasing, and we're seeing that ourselves here in the UK. So, you know, when you are concentrating on your GDPR policies, your GDPR procedures, and how you're handling data, don't forget your employees, because they have just as many rights under GDPR as your customers do, and they're more and more learning how to exercise them. And just recently, Bulgaria's Commission for Personal Data Protection fined an employer for delayed and incomplete response to an employee's subject access request. And then finally, the other thing to look at is how third parties are working with your data. Third party risk management is nothing new, but it's important to look at how third parties are using your data and that their privacy policies are mirroring yours. Otherwise, you find yourself in a legal black hole and a black hole that ICOs love to take you to task for. Um, So we will be looking at each of these in more detail as we go through 2020 so that we can try and ensure that all of our listeners know at least what's happening in the way of enforcement, where they need to be aware of perhaps further action in their own organisation. And of course, as I've mentioned earlier, if at any time you feel that we can help your organisation personally, we would of course be delighted to do so. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. We were approached by a client this week to try and define, under the terms of GDPR, what actually health research or medical research actually means. And having discussed it with some regulators, we've come to the conclusion that this is probably the best definition of medical research under GDPR that we can come up with. And there are five different ways something might treat as medical research. So, in no particular order. First is research with the goal of understanding the normal and abnormal functioning of the human body. Second, research specifically concerned with developing innovative strategies, products or services to diagnose, treat or prevent disease or injury. Third, Research with the goal of improving the diagnosis, treatment, rehabilitation and palliation of human disease and injury and of improving the health and quality of life of individuals. Four, research with the goal of improving the efficiency and effectiveness of health professionals in the healthcare system. And five, research with the goal of improving the health of the population as a whole or any part of the population through better understanding of social, cultural, environmental, occupational and economic factors on determining health status. And so by considering each of those uh, criteria, you should be able to establish if you are in the field of medical research whether what 
medical research you are doing and therefore what information you are holding falls within a appropriate description under GDPR to cover medical research because under recital 159 of GDPR it actually says that GDPR is interpreted in a broad manner including for example technological development and demonstration, fundamental research, applied research and privately funded research. In addition, scientific research should be subject to appropriate safeguards in respect of the rights and freedoms of the data subject under Article 89 Paragraph 1 of GDPR. And so it's worth thinking about that if you are involved in the field of medical research and making sure that you are complying with one of those criteria. Of course, you might be complying with more than one, that's fine. But otherwise, maybe medical research is not the reason you should be using as your legal basis for holding people's data. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. So that brings us to the end of this week's episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. I hope you found it useful. I hope you found it entertaining. Please do let me know. Let me have your feedback by sending an email to podcast.insurity.co.uk. You can find out more about us at Insurity at www.insurity.co.uk. And I look forward to speaking to you again, same time, same place, next week. Have a good week, everybody, and remember, keep your data safe. Check us out on Facebook. The GDPR Weekly Show is an insurity production. Follow us on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash insurity.